Welcome into another episode of First of the Floor. Ben Vallis here. Thank you for joining us. Hope you're doing well. The sixth-ish Boston Celtics annual award show is coming up in about five or ten minutes. But first, we would be remiss not to discuss all the play in action of the past 24 hours. Wayne Spoonie and Jake Eisenberg are joining me to do just that. How's it going, guys? Welcome. Living the Living. dream, dude. Play, dude. play in basketball. What's better just, than that? Just touching wood. Things are looking good. <laughs> if I was gonna say Rhyming myself, out of the fucking building. I know. Yeah, yeah great, <laughs> great start. Things are looking good though. Things have broken uh, so far. Touch wood. The way of the Celtics, and that the Sixers they beat the Miami Heat. The Heat lose in a kind of surprising fashion because it was a, a dog's breakfast of a game to begin with. Spoony, uh, I do believe maybe we could start here. We've got a clip from the playback of you guys reacting to one uh, Tobias Harris. Let's kick off with this one. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, cook him. It's a nice move. You got Tobias? Big boy. Oh, you're kidding. You're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the <laughs> six is going to it? win that game despite yeah. that display from Tobias Harris. Uh, and then obviously Jimmy Butler with the MCL injury, he's going to be out for uh, at least a couple of weeks here, which make things, makes Allegedly. things interesting for this next play in game and, uh, and what happens next uh, for the Celtics round one opponent. So uh, guys, just general takeaways from this game before we get into the awards. Dog was, shit. Yeah, disgusting. <laughs> Such a dis- like one of the most disgusting games I've seen. Like all the other playing games were like normal basketball games, and unsurprisingly, the Devil Miami Heat turned the the Seventy Sixers, who had won eight games in a row, into like CTE ball. Like Maxi, worst <laughs> game he's had in in a month. Embiid, who's looked good, they completely just reverted him to all of the bad habits, uh, and we were like, okay, well, it's like this is actually good. We, we kind of changed our minds throughout the game several times. Like, okay, maybe if this is what the Sixers look like, this is who we want. And then the Sixers did figure it out, like, in the second half. And we're like, no, I think we actually do want the Heat. If you can just, like, repel the magic for a little bit, there's only so much they can damage they can really do. And then, I mean, you never want to see injuries. But, um, you know, Jimmy Butler, <laughs> the, the, the Heat losing, and then... <laughs> and then and then Jimmy Butler is being injured uh, as they fall into the eight seed play-in game. I mean, it's tough to see. Yeah, so um, look, if the Heat had a good coach, they would have taken him out of the zone after Philly <laughs> figured it out in the second half. Um, you know, Joe Missoula haters, take note, even the best coach <laughs> in the league, sometimes just has absolutely no answers. Um but good God, that was horrible, terrible, disgusting basketball. Um, but that's what the Heat do to people. They do it to everyone. They can't score, and they junk you up. Uh, and, I mean, yeah, I just, like, I'm not even sure what we watched. Like, that Tobias Harris clip is, like, just, like, uncut, raw Sixers Heat play-in game right there. That's basically what that <laughs> entire game was like. It was so bad, so terrible. Um, and I'm not scared of either of those teams, but it's not going to matter because we're playing the Bulls. I've, I called it weeks ago when we did Blizzard Brain takes. I was like, we are playing the Bulls. I've been on that. I like that Bulls team. They're pretty good. They can actually score, unlike the Heat. Um, so I, I just like, I don't know, like is Embiid, like he looked exhausted like in the first quarter. I, I mean, he was like barely running up and down the court. And then Butler's, I get he was hurt. He's gonna be hurt. So the Heat have basically nothing without Jimmy Butler. Bam took nine shots, which is just <laughs> ridiculous in a do or die game. Your other All Star takes nine shots. So, uh, yeah, things are breaking pretty nicely. And I actually would rather play the Bulls than the Heat, even though the Heat looked terrible, which yeah. is you know devil. Yeah, magic. I agree. I kept doing and throwing on who my preferred uh, matchup would be throughout the game. Like both teams took so yeah. many turns at looking <laughs> like absolute dog shit that I, I continued to change my mind. Um, but if it does end up being the heat, it looks like we're probably getting the, the lesser healthy of those two teams. And obviously that's advantage Celtics in that particular case, as much as we don't wish injury upon anyone, including uh, people from the Miami heat, as much as we hate them. Um, we're re- it's really unfortunate to see that from Jimmy Butler's perspective, but um, obviously 
that falls to the advantage of the Celtics and that we get a, a lesser health, a healthy of those two teams. But it looks like Caruso, he's going to be back for the Bulls who beat the Hawks uh, again yesterday in game two of those playing games. Uh, but the Bulls at this stage look like the stronger of the two teams with, with Butler um, injured. I just want to say it's important to note as well. So where the Sixers game turned was they have the promotion for the free chicken. If you miss two for free, yeah. they call it bricking, bricking for chicken. And, <laughs> and, this is very, and this is very important. Caleb Martin mm-hmm. is at the free throw line. He misses two free throws. And I shit you not, that completely changed the game. The crowd was booing the, the team. The, the the fans had turned on the team. This is what happens in Philly. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The, the players are scared. They play scared. They play bad. The, the fans are scared. They start booing. That leads to the players being more scared. And that's what was happening. Caleb Martin bricks two free throws. Crowd goes nuts. Sixers go on a run. And then French Al Horford or French Derek White um, goes nuts for the rest of the game. Nicholas Batum. Uh, when I was watching when I was watching the, the uh, Sixers stream afterwards, I actually went back and watched the whole game on the Unoball stream because I had to just go through all the emotions with them. And uh, Sam Sheehan, uh, Celtics Twitter guy, was like, He's he's French Al Horford, and all the six people were like, no, he can't be French Al Horford because he was so bad for us. We'll accept French Terry White. I was just there's just so many subplots <laughs> here, but yeah, that's what happens when you make a deal with the devil, Caleb Martin and Pat Riley. It comes back to bite you eventually. Uh, yeah. You do have to pay that debt back uh, eventually, yes. but just a wild game of of subpar uh, play in basketball where none of the four teams looked particularly good. And if you're a Celtics fan or or the Celtics themselves, you're you're sitting back feeling pretty good about who the eventual first round matchup might be. Now we do have a live podcast coming up with Dan Greenberg, AKA Stool Greeny of Barstool Sports, Saturday night live here on YouTube at 8 p.m. East, where we'll be previewing what will finally then be the eventuated first round matchup. We'll finally know, but I guess what we're saying here is that the Celtics are going to be likely supremely better than whoever they end up facing in that first round from what's been on display from this playing tournament so far. Anything else from the, the playing games, guys, that you want to get to before we get into these awards? So uh, can I just say real quick on the Jimmy Butler injury? That's why you avoid the playing game. Uh, because shit happens when you play extra games as there was a double Jake in there real yes. quick. Like, Multi Jake. Yeah. <laughs> Should I just log out? We'll get two Jakes in here. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Um, but like, that's why you want to avoid the play a game. That's why the regular season matters. You dick around like Butler plays 50 something games or whatever. They don't give a shit for the regular season. We'll just sneak our way into the seven or eight seed. It's not a big deal. Well, guess what? You play an extra game. Jimmy Butler gets hurt and your season's probably over. So like, that's why it matters. That's why you should try. Um, and that's why you should win the the conference by 14 games. Easy, dude. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I'm pretty sure I haven't checked the odds recently, like in the last few hours, but I think that Nick Sixers has opened up. It's pretty much a, a pick em. They're both close to, to 50-50 odds there. I'm picking the Knicks all day on that one, just based alone on how um, – dodgy Joel Embiid's knee looked and his conditioning looked uh, in that first game you don't really anticipate getting any better on that front in the next week or so going up against the Knicks team where essentially all their starters are going to be playing 48 minutes apiece uh, and just going hardcore at Joel Embiid uh, you know Brunson and Mitchell Robinson pick and roll just put Joel Embiid in that action all night and just exhaust the shit out of him uh, it seems like an obvious approach and it will be to the detriment of the Sixers uh, in my opinion who are you guys picking in that series yeah, Jack Simone in front of the pod here about them Celtics is freaking out about the Sixers being favoured here. I don't think it's crazy, dude. Like, Jalen Brunson, great season, going to win first team All-NBA over Jason Tatum, it looks like, and it's going to be an abomination. Um, the gap in the best player in that series, I get MB didn't look awesome there. The Knicks just smell to me like the regular season team really, really badly. Nick Nurse. I think if you just cook up a scheme to slow down Brunson for regular for a playoff series, I think you can like they have no other creation outside of him, and that's where you start to miss Randall. And I don't know, man. I I I'm, I'm probably gonna lean Sixers. The two days off between games, a couple of the games, like two days off between that game against the Heat and Game One, like there's a, there's a chance he just kind of gets stronger as, as as time goes along as well. Uh, didn't yeah, he have I, six I, games off after playing, was it Orlando? 
it, it's not like that time did him particularly well. Sorry to cut you off, Spoonie, but like it, in the short term, you know, last couple of weeks, it's not like the rest has done him beat any good. He was well, good in the fourth quarter. Just saying. That's that's true. He, he was. He was good in the fourth quarter. He made some threes, which is like you can kind of do that a little bit tired. But he's looked like pretty good other than the playing game. I think that was by far his worst game since he's come back. And it's against Miami. Like that's what they that's do the to star players. That's what happens. Like I don't think the Knicks can really do that to them. I so Jake put in check this out on our Discord. Jake put in like a bracket picker. Oh, yeah. I have uh, I think Knicks in seven. I think it's going to be a really tight series. But if Embiid was like 100% healthy, I think it's Sixers in a wash. Um, but because he is not, I do think the Knicks have the slight advantage. But it being a pick em does not surprise me at all. Like mm-hmm. the Knicks are the most try hard regular season team we've ever witnessed. Like the difference between their half court offense and their total offense is the largest in the league, right? So their transition turning you over, offensive rebound, all the bullshit that doesn't translate to the playoffs is what the Knicks do. They play their starters 40 minutes a night. Other teams will finally start doing that in the playoffs. So that advantage is gone. They play harder than everybody else. That advantage is gone in the playoffs. So I do think that their ceiling is not real. It's not nearly as high as the Sixers, but like MB, dude, he was like waltzing up the court at times in a do or die playing game when you want to avoid the yeah. Celtics. So like yeah. he's obviously not got it a hundred percent. Um, so I do think the Knicks will win, but I think it's going to be much closer than than I, our friend Jack Simone thinks. I don't know how many all time Nicholas Batum games the Sixers are going to get in this this first round series against the also Knicks. True. The Knicks. He's good. The Knicks are more than capable of it's shutting good. them. Yeah, he, he's good. He's, he's like... so underrated, dude. I was reading Mavs Twitter and they were after like as they were watching the game because like they had those Clippers series, Mavs uh, Clippers, and they were like legitimately exci- like. They don't, people don't understand that Nick Batum not being in this matchup is a really big deal. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, I think he's one of those guys that like you don't know until you know. So, I, I guess so. I mean, we'll Batum see. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. He's, there's going to be more, more, more Nick Batum games to come. You heard it here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Looking forward to seeing that and whatever else eventuates in the first round. And uh, meanwhile, the Celtics successfully on the other side of the bracket there from the Sixers. But we'll talk more about that and that first round matchup with Greeny in a couple of nights time. Again, live Saturday night, 8 p.m. here on our YouTube channel, the First of the Floor YouTube channel, which you should subscribe to. If you're watching over there on the very awesome CLNS YouTube channels, hop over here, First of the Floor, like, subscribe, then hop back to CLNS, like, subscribe over there as well. Uh, very thankful to the CLNS network for presenting this show. All right, guys, let's get into the awards. That's right. It's that time of year again. It's time for the sixth annual First of the Floor Boston Celtics Awards. Thanks to everyone who voted on the awards this year, especially everyone in our Discord, which if you want to join, the links are in the description below along with various other ways you can support the show or become more involved with the First of the Floor podcast. Now, obviously, the outcome of these awards can sway the probability of a player's Hall of Fame eligibility along with their (laughs) overall prestige of their legacy. So this is really important stuff. Jake, Spoonie... Any opening thoughts on the awards before we get going? I think everybody that was nominated should go home feeling proud. And everybody that wasn't mm-hmm. nominated should go home feeling proud. Like this is this is tough to crack these awards. You know, Leonardo DiCaprio didn't win, you know, how many Oscars for some incredible films and eventually he snuck in for Revenant. So um, I would just I would just suggest to all contestants to not feel too bad if they don't go home with anything. <laughs> yeah, hey, look, it's award season in basketball, and these are by far the most important awards in NBA award season. So, That's right. um, yeah, like, look, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to enjoy it. I'm sorry for the losers. It took Scorsese a long time, too. Like, yeah, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but yeah, let's get into it. <laughs> well, let's start off. We've got the Avery Bradley Award for Most Improved Player, the nominees for which are Peyton Pritchard, Sam Hauser, Derek White, and Jalen Brown. And without any further ado, let's announce the winner here. The winner of this very prestigious award, as I scroll and look for the video, is... It's Peyton Pritchard. Woo! Congratulations, Peyton Pritchard, as he approaches the stage. He won uh, by a massive amount, getting 58.1% of the votes for 
most improved player and quite an improvement on last season. Plus nine minutes per game. We went from 5.6 to 9.6 points per game. Three-point accuracy is up. Assists per game are up. Rebounds, steals are up. Turnovers down. His net rating, guys, went from plus 1.4 to plus 13.6. And his assist to turnover ratio went from 1.6 to 4.6 all uh, within the breadth of a single season. Uh, An incredible MIP uh, and well-worthy MIP award there for Peyton Pritchard, guys. I just want to note, we had nearly 200 responses for these awards. So firstly, shout out everybody that voted. Good call. Good call. Like, I mean, a landslide in how many votes (laughs) we've had um, in years past, I'm guessing. And so, yeah, Peyton Pritchard takes on 58% of the vote here. I mean, you can't go wrong with Peyton Pritchard. Not my vote, but yeah, Peyton took an obvious leap kind of across the board here. The playmaking was something that I didn't quite see coming. He didn't even have his an awesome shooting season, which I think speaks to how much he actually did improve because, you know, he was below 40% on the year. And if you were to tell me that before the season, I would have said that's actually kind of a disappointing season for Pritchard from what we're expecting. But he improved playmaking, shot creation, defensively rebounding across the board, just overall impact, confidence. Shout out, little P. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, so this is not a maxi MIP candidacy where it's like, hey, he just got more shots. He just got more opportunities. He just got more minutes. Like, this is legitimate improvement. He got more minutes. He got more shots. But his assist to turnover ratio, career high. His assist percentage, second best ever. Um, his rebounding percentage, because he's a sneaky little rebounder, like that's his best ever. So not only did he like get more minutes, but everything scaled up with him and improved career high and true shooting percentage, massive, massive Peyton Pritchard uh, season. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome, Mary. What what an entrance. (laughs) Um, So uh, like he, he just... He just added dimensions to his game, which I think is the important thing. It's like skill improvement more than just the stats. Like he just looked a lot more comfortable driving to the rim, finishing around the rim, gnashing, making plays, operating the offense and the shooting. Yeah, you're you're right, Jake. Like he wasn't shooting lights out over 40 percent, but 38 and a half percent on some of the threes he takes is very, very good. So he's got the shooting weapon. You got to defend him for that. And he uses that as a tool to get himself into the paint. And, dude, he's had some highlights, man. He's saucing people. Like, he took Patrick Baldwin's lunch money in that Wizards game with those crossovers and that spin move to the layup. So, shout out PP. Great season. We'll always have March and April PP. Uh, What an incredible, incredible stretch of the season. And keeping us locked in, engaged, and entertained after everything was well and truly wrapped up. As we move on to the Jordan Crawford MVP Award, the nominees for which are Jason Tatum, Derek White, Chris Stapps Porzingis, and Jalen Brown. The winner is... Hey. It's Jason Tatum. Hey. <laughs> Congratulations, Jason Tatum. As he approaches wow. the stage to collect the sixth annual Jordan Crawford MVP McConaughey's award. McConaughey's there. <laughs> Nick Cage is there. Oh, it's a who's who of uh, a first of the floor, uh, sixth annual uh, annual Boston Celtics awards. Uh, really, what a time to be alive! As I try and kill this graphic here, guys. Jason Tatum, obvious choice, best player on the best team. But I guess I'll ask you, Spoonie, with a, such a stacked roster, how does one manage to stand out as the MVP across so much talent? I don't know, average 27, 8, and 5 on, like, a plus true shooting percentage and elite defense is a pretty good start, in my opinion, something Jalen yeah. Brunson has not done this year. You know, I'm just <laughs> picking a name out of a hat, another all-star out of a hat. Like, maybe, you know, elite defense probably fucking matters. But, hey, who am I to say? Um, but, look, <laughs> we solved the Jason Tatum sitting on the bench problem this year. We still had a massive net rating when he was – on the bench finally for once but guess what he still made us about three points per 100 possessions better when he was on the court so like you take a stacked roster and then you add him and he makes it even better he is a floor raiser he is a ceiling raiser he is not bad at anything and he is great about at at just about everything in basketball 
and that is the makings of a superstar. And the three came back. He shot 37.5% from three, man, after we were flirting around with, like, the high 35s and stuff like that. The pull-up came back. He had an awesome season. I think the most important thing for me is he understood how good his team was, and he was willing to take a little step back in usage and field goal attempts, just a little bit, and let, you know, and really play the best team basketball of his entire career, deserving MVP. I don't think there was any choice here, really. Any other choice? Yeah, I'm proud of I'm proud of the voters for this one. Like, I understand wanting to maybe go a different direction, but when it comes down to it, Tatum's still the guy. And I think on the, on this run, we're going to see why he is that guy. And he's been incredible all year long. I thought it was easily the best. It's it's crazy. It was it was easily the best year of his career for me. Like the fact that three point shooting came back would have been like very high on our list of things we wanted to see. The three point volume was still there. The pull up came back. The decision making though, assists up, turnovers down. Like that is something that's really important going to the playoffs. It's like, can you can control what you can tr- what you can control in the playoffs and limiting turnovers and making sure teams that someone like the Heat or the Magic or the Bulls that have issues scoring the basketball in the half court against an elite defense, if you're not turning the ball over, which Tatum's going to have the ball in his hands a lot, playing 40-plus minutes, he's making the right decisions, making the right play, getting off the ball, letting the ball come back to him. Really important. I thought just like, to quote the great Ben Vallis, just a captain's knock all year long, <laughs> um, leading, leading from top to bottom. Yeah, I couldn't have put it better myself. A real captain's luck <laughs> of a season there for Jason Tatum. And adding the post-ups to his game, it's it's like mm. adding a, a new stroke to your uh, your cricket uh, batsman repertoire, adding totally. a nice cover, cover drive to the repertoire there. That's right. Uh, the post I always obviously. say that. Yeah, Spoonie's <laughs> always in my ear about the cricketing uh, references there. So good to finally bring that onto the show. Uh, a consummate vibesman, I'll say, uh, like really uh, leading the pack in that sense. You guys have kind of covered all of the on-the-court stuff. Um, but just really a, a leader on and off the court on all fronts and, and basically becoming a face of the M- uh, of the NBA as well, just with his personality uh, on and off the court too. Uh, he leads the team in usage rate, 31.1%. His assist percentage is in the 91st percentile league-wide. Defensive rebound, rebounding percentage per cleaning of the glass in the 94th percentile. And yeah, you guys said it. Uh, you said it earlier, Spoonie. We did a wish list podcast ahead of the season, and one of my wishes was could Jason Tatum get his three point positioning up around that uh, ninety seven to ninety eight percent mark, and he got his uh, pull up threes alone up to thirty seven point two percent, and overall three point shooting again per cleaning the glass up to thirty eight percent. I think it was down around thirty four percent last year. So getting it up to that level and holding it there for the second half of the season bodes extremely well heading into the playoffs as well. So, and I would also add that he's one of the better defensive players on the team as mm-hmm. well. Which does segue nicely into the next award, the Ayo. Cobra Strike Depoy Award. The nominees for which are Jason Tatum, Derek White, Chris Stapps Porzingis, Jalen Brown, and Drew Holiday. Folks in the chat, let us know who you think is most deserving for this award. Who's going to be the winner? Drum roll, please. It is. Derek White. Let's Derek go. White is the winner. We do not have a, a fancy video oh, for this no. one. <laughs> we do have a little sound bite though. There we go. Uh, Derek White, uh, the winner by a huge margin, got 64.2% of the votes. Um, uh, probably an easy winner of this award, although there are many uh, worthy candidates, which is what has made this team so dominant throughout the season, guys. But Derek White, 100th percentile at his position in block percentage, which is probably a good way to kick off the conversation. I close my eyes and see Derek White you know, trailing a pick and roll ball handler and getting up over the top of them and clipping the ball off their hands before they get the shot off uh, multiple times per game. He is an amazing person. He is an amazing basketball player. And specifically, he is an amazing defender, Jake. He's done it. He's done it. <laughs> Every, Mr. White will send you we'll send you this clip in, in the mail here. But um, it's, you know, great award, the Cobra Strike Depoy Award, obviously in memory of Marcus Smart here. And not... No, no one quite Cobra strikes in the same way that Marcus Smart does. But, you know, obviously, depending on the interpretation of this award, who is the best offender, I try to take it literally here. And Derek White, you know, actually was third on the team in steals. Jalen with 83 steals, Tatum with 75, Derek with 74, Drew with 61. But Derek White, 87 blocks, which is 16th in the NBA. Total. That's absurd. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Total blocks. 
absurd. Isaiah Hartenstein, Avita Zubac, Jared Allen, Nurkic, Giannis, uh, Jakob Pertl, Evan Mobley, Jonathan Isaac, like Bam Adebayo, Embiid. Like the, those are all players that Derek White had more blocks than this year, which are absolutely absurd. And Luke Spoon, I'll let you go, but I've got I've got a couple of um, my favorite Derek White block moments to run after okay. after you. All right. Sweet. Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make a very good intro into that video because I voted <laughs> for Drew Holiday. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. And the reason I did is because I think he was asked to do a more difficult things than Derek White was. Derek White was basically always on the point guard, which he's great at, and we should be deploying him in that way. But Holiday, when we went zone, was at the center of that zone, basically acting like the quarterback. There was times he was guarding Embiid and did a really good job. There was times he was guarding, well, he got smoked by SGA, but everybody did other than Tatum. Um, but he he just, I think, Drew Holiday defended a a larger variety of players, and I think there's a lot of value to that, and he did a really good job. But obviously, Derek White's amazing. He would have been my second pick. Um, and, like, yeah, like the lock and trail, like getting around screens, like the – he doesn't miss a switch like he does not ever blow a switch Derek White and that is so valuable and it's stuff like it's hard to see when you're watching the game and then you go back and like watch clips or you know we do our our um underrated plays and it's like always Derek White like pointing and he's just never in the wrong and that's super valuable to have guys who are not only amazing on ball but incredible off ball so Derek White great defender but I did vote for True Holiday but you know <laughs> Spoiled for choice, really. Like, you could have easily voted <laughs> for KP as well in his rim defense or all season. Yeah, or Tatum, absolutely. Well, Who I just said is probably, like, maybe secretly, quietly the best overall defender on the team just in terms of his versatility. Well, interestingly, so Derek White gets 64% of the vote here. The next closest, Jalen Brown, 15.3%, and then Drew Holiday at 13 and Chris Tapps at 58 and Tatum at 1.5% here. Um, and I wonder if that's part... I wonder if partly is that that's the Cobra Strike element of of the award. Is that he's not really a Cobra Strike type guy. I would actually say no. he's like a very drowsy when it comes to the Cobra Strike type maneuvers. Not really his <laughs> not really his forte. But yeah, I, quite an interesting breakdown. Uh, I thought because mm. none of us really mentioned Jalen. I do think maybe and going back to the most improved thing, like he Jalen was my vote, and the defense was a massive part of that. His best defensive season of his career. But I still think. Um, a very wide gap relative to what Derek White and Drew Holiday give you defensively compared to their position. Yeah, maybe if we introduced a defensive MIP award, that's something that Jalen might be able to get up for next year. But yeah, (laughs) you have me thinking that maybe we should share our awards results after the show is done so everyone can get in there and see how close some of the votes were and just how much some people ran away with these awards. Look, we've got plenty more awards to get to. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Last bit. Oh, you want want to play this clip? Yeah, yeah, Derek play. White. Derek White blocks. Enjoy this 41 seconds of my my two favorite Derek yes, Block please. moments of the season. Tatum dribbled it off a foot. Nice pass ahead. And only a shot blocked by White. Derek White block hustles back on defense. Don't even know how he got to that as Royce O'Neal tried to go back. To hold on to the win. Long outlet for Butler. Swatted by White. It's... Up to grabs out of bio, brings it down. Butler rejected Derek White, the first guy there. Out of bio beats the shot clock. Brown may have gotten away with a push off, and out of bio gets it from behind. Here comes Butler the other way. Close. And White right blocked it. <sighs> Unreal. So, so I'm good. Wor- I'm working on a full like Derek White blocks of the year video and I just spent nice. like all this morning, I watched every block of the season and I just sat there in disbelief, <laughs> just shaking my head at, like, how does he do any of this? So beautiful stuff. Chrome Dome Derek, who knew just how awesome <laughs> he would be. Now, look, we've got plenty more awards to get to, but first, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. March is over, but the biggest moments of college basketball tip off in the month of April. Be a part of the action on Prize Picks for both men's and women's college basketball. And get 
Get in on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. You can even make the play-in rounds like seem interesting since we all know the Celtics won't be there. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what make prize picks the number one fantasy sports app. Personally, I'm looking at Derek White more on points because they are criminally low and we all know Derek White is going to come up big in the postseason. So download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, download, sign up, use that code CLNS for a first deposit match of $100. It's a great deal. You can supplement your game viewing experience by choosing less or more on a variety of different picks. Spoonie, Jake, and I have been doing uh, a similar thing between the three of us. Sorry, Spoonie, I, I, haven't, I didn't tee you up for this uh, <laughs> promo before the show, but um, this is for the second time in a row. <laughs> um, <laughs> but ver- varying success, which is part of the fun. I know I went PP more than points on our first matchup uh, and failed miserably. It was the one game for, uh, see, during March yeah. for Peyton Pritchard where he fell well and truly short of, I think it was only a 11.5, less or more. Yeah. Uh, and he was well and truly less on that one, unfortunately. Yeah, we should do it for tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night's yeah. games for sure. Uh-huh. Uh, we went 0-3, uh, so not yeah. a great start <laughs> to the first of the floor prize pick. Yeah, you, use uh, responsibly. Yeah, but hey, you know, nobody can be made fun of. The Nobody costs us money. We all cost each other <laughs> money, or me money, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, 0-3, not a great start, which means we're due, boys. We're going to win right. some money tomorrow. Let's do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. All right. The Phil Pressy Award for We Didn't See You Much. But it was fun when we did. The nominees are Jordan Walsh, Delano Banton, Svi Mihailuk, Jaden Springer, and Lamar Stevens. Remember that guy. And the winner is, it is one, Jordan Walsh. Jordan Walsh is the winner. We didn't see you much. But it was fun (laughs) when we did. He really ran away with this award. 68.4% percent of the votes while she we knew we were going to love this guy the moment he was drafted <laughs> uh clearly everyone who voted on these awards all nearly 200 of them felt exactly the same way uh didn't see a lot of jordan walsh this season spoonie but boy it was fun when we did well i mean uh, look so i came <laughs> up with this award i almost named it the jordan walsh award for <laughs> yes, <laughs> much, but, as well. yeah but look uh, we've talked about it a lot there's just something really fun about like this athletic freak second round pick that you just have no idea what he could be and he just shows these like weird flashes that are super fun like you know we've we've done an underrated plays like the greatest cuts we've ever seen in nba history one of the sweetest free throw makes i've ever seen i mean it barely (laughs) touched the bottom of the net it was so smooth Uh, he missed the first one but that's okay you know we got room for improvement so warm up Walsh Walsh is really fun. He's like he's got that like frantic energy on the defensive end that I think can really translate. Um like almost like a young Marcus Smart, like that first year of Smart, it took him until the end of the season to really direct that energy in the right way. And he was like going crazy against the Cavs in that first round playoff series that we got swept. Walsh can be that guy, but he's 6 foot 7 with a 7 foot wingspan. He's just like an interesting prospect that we don't we we have no other prospects right too so there's like extra attention on him and it's just fun we just want him to be successful it's good time and the garden's in on it too which yeah. i think is the best part oh yeah uh if i was gonna uh, how many minutes do you think jordan walsh played this year if, if you had to oh. guess oh, not I'm nearly enough. money at this <laughs> 75 his booty has been on fire so ben take that with a grain of salt there you go <laughs> uh i'll say oh i'll say 55 83 gone oh, over. Spoonie. Oh, Spoonie's, on. Spoonie's been on fire. He he was one minute <laughs> off the O'Shea Brissett minute guess, which was 599 when he guessed 600. He has been cooking on minute guesses lately. But yeah, I think he absolutely encapsulates the award. Didn't see you much. 83 minutes for an entire season. But when we did, it was absolutely electric. Um, if if Smee uh didn't have a vendetta against Jordan Walsh, maybe we would have gotten a few more few more buckets from Jordan Walsh but yeah this was this was a no-brainer 
Yeah, well, runner-up was Svi Mihailuk. Uh, <laughs> unsurprisingly, what, maybe the most uh, athletic 14th guy on the bench in the entire league, just getting up over head over the rim on multiple occasions for Recency ridiculously. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> maybe was it the preseason that he like double pumped uh, a yeah. reverse alley yeah. attempt? Uh, and I fell in love uh, from that moment onwards. And it's been amazing ever since. All right, let's get to the next one. Oh, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, ben, sorry. <laughs> Spoiler. Who, who <laughs> voted for Jaden Springer? Come on. <laughs> we got, we got <laughs> 12 people votes for Jaden Springer. Pe- right, people love Jaden Springer. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Uh, he's he's Sorry, sturdy. He's sturdy, yeah. man. <laughs> All right. We're ready for the next award. The most vibious player award. The Blake Griffin Award for most vibious player. The nominees are the Mias Cater, Latvian Moses. This is one we allowed people to add their own nominations. So Latvian Moses, a.k.a. Kristaps Porzingis, got a couple of nominations. Joe Jitsu, Kristaps Porzingis, <laughs> <laughs> O'Shea Brissett, and Luke Cornett. And without any further ado, the winner of the Blake Griffin Most Vibiest Player Award goes to Luke Cornett. There we go. Big dog. <laughs> the Eclipse. Oh. The uh, the the big cornet. I don't know. What are we, I'm missing out on his nicknames? Big Bird. Uh, the Cornish cornet game head. Negative. Cornish game hen. Thank you. There we go. Really being co- cornet positive since uh, since the yes. All Star break. Uh, a deserved award for easily the the most vibiest player on this roster in lieu of Blake Griffin, who unfortunately and sadly retired from the game of basketball recently. Uh, maybe we can get to some Blake Griffin clips uh, before we wrap <laughs> this one up, guys. But <laughs> cornet. He's got the sellies. He's got the amazing post-game interviews. He's got the lemon squares in the locker room, the corn hub. Thanks, Troy, in the chat, and Jamie D in the chat. Um, he's just a consummate vibes, man. I don't know. What else can you say, Spoonie? Dude, he stole my heart as a as a <laughs> massive nerd uh, who I tweeted about a fantasy series I'm about to finish, and it feels like I'm going <laughs> to dinner with one of my best – like the last dinner. Like my best friend is moving away to Seattle. Uh and it's like our last dinner before he leaves. And like, this is the last book of the fantasy series. That's how I've... When Luke Cornett was photographed with the Lord of the Rings on the steps somewhere, like Philadelphia or something. And it's like, this is just so goofy. It looks ridiculous. He, he looks like a sophomore in college. who's trying to like look interesting <laughs> to women or something like that. You know, it's like, I read. Huh? You want to go for coffee sometime? Uh, but Cornet's he's got the, the deep best. quotes. He's got the de- yeah. He's got the super deep quotes. He and like every interview, he's just got like that dry sense of humor. Very Blake Griffin. Um, so love Cornet, and he hooped the shit out of the ball this year. Like he absolutely hooped starting like three, four months. Like he was terrible to start the season. Then he figured it out, and that makes it that much more fun. My favorite moment from Cornet this year was definitely. The Pacers game in Indiana, the Celtics couldn't make a free throw to save their lives. And Luke Cornett yes. got fouled, went to the line, knocked one down, and started doing the ice in my vein celebration in the middle of doing the free throws. And actually, turned he turned the game, he turned the free throw luck, and that was incredible. But, I mean, for, for, I, I voted for Chris Asporzingis. And I think Luke, I, I thought he met expectations. I thought we kind of knew he was a vibesman coming in. And with Blake being gone, you know, that's kind of Cornette's role at the end of the bench there. But Chris Asposing is coming in and providing the level of vibes that he did for everyone, both on court and off court, I think is actually low-key very important and actually had impact on the overall success of the team. Like him coming in and becoming best friends with Jalen, him, you know, going into the crowd and high-fiving dudes like after he, you know, has a block, like he legitimately... Uh, no one's ever had more fun in the span of six months than Chris Porzingis has had since coming to Boston. Like the amount of winks per minute this guy was averaging kiss. this season. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, yes, the Derek White kiss. Oh my god, still jealous. But yeah, I think. Winks um, per minute. Yeah, I think. I think. I think. KP for me. DJ Daniel in the chat here uh, has got my back on this one. So yeah, KP leads for me. the league in WPM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Off the charts. Yeah. Hundredth percentile in WPM. Uh, look, just while we're on the subject of the most vibious players, let's just get to this very quickly in memoriam of one Blake Griffin. He gets one from White. Now he gives it White. Oh, 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 Blake Griffin. Yes. Throw it up. 
at Cliff Beautiful. has been sitting dormant in our stream out of cart for a well over a year now. So very glad to be able to click that button again. All right, let's get to the Marcus Smart No No Yes Award. The nominees for which are Jalen Brown, Sfima Hyluk, Xavier Tillman, and Drew Holiday. The winner is... It's Drew Holiday, <laughs> winner of the No No Yes Award. Named after one Marcus Smart, who used to chuck up his fair share of no-no-yes shots. Drew mm. Holiday, this is maybe a nod to the Drew earlier in the season, who was still etching out his role in the team on oh, both both ends, but obviously we're speaking offensively here. He would dribble down the court with so many passing opportunities and options available to him and just chuck up ill-advised shot after ill-advised shot. Obviously held a pretty decent percentage, which again climbed as the season went on as he found his role. But earlier on, that was he had his fair share of no, no, yes shots. So he is the winner of this award. Um, there are some other runner-ups, which we'll get to. Some some pretty close ones here. Some yeah. uh, pretty uh, notable names there in the list. But um, what do you guys think of the outcome of this award? This is definitely ahead, one of the Jay. more. This is definitely one of the more split awards, and I think. True Holiday season was almost like a no, no, yes. It was like we had to, we had to go through the no, no, yes early in the year. And then we eventually figured out that it's a yes because on pull up three point shots this year, 39.3%. So of all players that took at least two three point pull ups per game this season, Drew was sixth in the NBA in three point percentage. Like that's, that's, that's just a straight up yes. Um, and we just had to, We've got a lot of kind of emotional baggage when it comes to the pull-up three in general. You add that to the Marcus Smart element. Like, I think it makes sense that we were struggling with it. But now when he takes them, I'm just like, yep. They're out of the... Look, they still come out of rhythm sometimes. But pull-up threes that come out of rhythm that go in are back-breaking for the opponent because, like, there's nothing you can do to defend them. So if you feel kind of helpless when they go in. So if you're going to knock them down at a high rate, then take them, baby. Let's go. Okay, so Drew... Shot 43% for three. Like, he, yeah. yeah, okay. I think you're right, Ben. Early season Drew Holiday, we were like, what the hell's going on? And mm -hmm. I think we had compared Marcus Smart to him for so long that we just kind of convinced ourselves he was Marcus Smart. But he's just such a much better shooter than Marcus Smart. I voted for Jalen because Jalen took some insane threes. Like, some of these pull-ups he was taking were nuts, and he would – like when he was hot, he would bury them like those like weird, like, oh, he's crossed half court and he takes like a jab step and then pulls up and then he would sink it from like 27 feet. He still shot the Jalen still shot 35 percent on pull ups this year, which is like totally fine. So uh, there's not a lot of guys on this roster that are no, no guys because everybody can make shots. So I think this is a tough award, um, but I get it with Drew in some ways but yeah to your point jake like drew just made kind of made too many shots to win this award so that's why i voted for jalen brown because he did not make quite enough shots to be unknown uh or rather just a straight up no i guess he's a no no yes guy in that way sorry i'm I'm losing it, boys. Go ahead, please. No, I I mean, everyone, it, it all turned out to be pretty well. Yes, yes, yes. By the end of the season, yeah. everyone, yeah, everyone delivered on that front, uh, particularly PP. 41.3% uh, of the vote uh, Drew Holiday got. But yeah, first runner up, Jalen Brown got 34.2% of the vote of being uh, second place uh, for the no, no, yes award attributed to one Marcus Smart. Let's get to the next award the Celtics Killer Award, the Ish Smith. The Celtics Killer Award. Yes. This is one where we allowed people to nominate or add extra nominees. There are many. I'll read off a few. TJ McConnell, DeMar DeRozan, Pascal Siakam, Jamal Murray, Nikola Jokic, Bogdan, Bogdanovich, Pat Bev, Dean Wade, Jokic again, DeJounte Murray, <laughs> Peyton Watson, Austin Reeves, Aaron Neesmith, the city of Atlanta. Uh, there are so <laughs> many, but there can only be one winner. And the winner is one Dean Wade of the Cleveland yes. Cavaliers. Yes. I think uh, an obvious winner for this one. He just killed the shit out of us in that one game where we were up, what, 20 something points, fourth quarter. Then it's yeah. the Dean Wade show. Uh, the Dean Wade show, rather. Sorry, I've got a slight echo in my ear and it's completely messing up my ability to talk clearly. <laughs> uh, but that's a story for another day. Uh, Dean Wade, guys, this year's Ish Smith Celtics Killer Award winner. Jake, um, this one kind of wrote itself, right? It's a pretty easy, easy choice. This is, yeah, this is an easy one. 
I went back and looked at the game because I just wanted to like remember how insane it was relative to the context of that game, but also for his season. So 23 points on 8 for 11 from the field, 6 for 9 from 3. 23 points was his highest point total of the season. Um, he had 20 points in the fourth quarter, 7 for 7 from the field, 5 for 5 from 3. Tied for most three-point makes with one other game when he was 6 for 8 from 3. That is in. Insane, dude. Five for five from three in the fourth quarter alone. Like that is just one of the all all time all time games to like to come from a from a nobody really. Not a nobody, but like just like a. I mean, it's Dean Wade. It's Dean Wade, dude. He, he's a nobody, Jake. Yeah, come say. on. He's a nobody. <laughs> I don't know. He's he, the Cleveland fan. Love Cleveland fans love Dean Wade. So I, I'm 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 now I'm, they uh, do because he killed <laughs> us. Yeah, right. Oh, that's for damn sure, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Dean Wade, easy vote for me, and it's just off one game. Like, Jokic, guys like that, sure. like, they can't be Celtics killers because they kill everybody, you know what I mean? Bogey Bogdanovich is a pretty good one, and that was a write-in vote. So I, I think, you know, he he's a decent one, but Dean Wade was just so random, so fucking stupid, and it was such a dumb loss. <laughs> that, it, that, that loss is going to stick in our brains for years, you know what I mean? It's going to be the Dean Wade game, so... He's just a great winner for this award. Hopefully, he doesn't keep it going. He's not Ish Smith, and he's going to torture us for yeah. 15 years. Second uh, round but, of the playoffs? Yeah. Right. Oh, God, don't say it, please. <laughs> hey. uh, but, yeah, great. Yeah, the Dean Wade Award. Give it to yeah, him. Actually the, actually, the most important injury of the playoffs is that Dean Wade's status is questionable going into the playoffs. So. Huge, huge. Hey, yeah. Massive injuries, factor. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we may now win the championship. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's move on. The... Philadelphia 76ers award for the most hateable franchise in the league. <laughs> uh, many, many nominees for this one. Uh, but again, there can only be one winner. And this year, the fans voted in and they chose the Milwaukee Bucks. Yes. This year's most hateable franchise, deservedly so. Largely thanks to their fans on Twitter and Reddit. And just the annoying way that anyone associated with the Milwaukee Bucks carries themselves particularly online spoony do you agree with the result of this award yeah i voted for the bucks i think they were just good enough to be annoying um and like they were so they're so obviously a paper tiger in a lot of ways but you know they'd win a big game against oklahoma city and all of a sudden they're back baby oh dame time oh point to the watch and they beat us twice which was really really unfortunate um uh, so, yeah, it's got to be the Bucks. Their fans have turned insufferable because of that one kind of Mickey Mouse-ish championship. Uh, so, I I mean, like, you know, the Sixers, Embiid got hurt, and that's why they're out of this. Uh, I feel like if Embiid was healthy and they were the second-best team in the East, it would easily be the Sixers fans. But for now, it's the Bucks. Yeah, I think it for me it was easily the Bucks because it was so frustrating all year long how – many media members, how many big podcast people that were talking about the NBA, talking about the Celtics, talking about the Bucks, were just ignoring all of their glaringly obvious issues and completely hand-waving them away. Whereas if, if it was the Celtics, they'd be like, see, they're completely flawed. There's no chance they can win a title. But week in, week out, despite every month them having like a, a teens net rating, Dame looking washed, Middleton being injured and looking washed, their whole roster looking old, year, like month in, month out, it'd be like, yeah, but you know playoffs different different thing like just completely hand waving all of their issues all year long um that was what the most frustrating thing to me is that, like if you wanted to say like hey maybe they get lucky and they win sure but just to be like yeah i think they could just do it and we're gonna ignore all of their issues drove me nuts yeah nathan margian on twitter is like a yes. notable bucks twitter guy saying okay now it's the playoffs wipe the clay wipe the slate clean wipe away everything you learnt during the regular season, the players are a different time. And I'm like, are we supposed to do that as well? We just won 64 games in dominant fashion. Are we supposed to wipe away our regular season as well and just not take that into account for the context of the postseason? I don't think that's how it works. So uh, it's quite convenient of a mindset there of, of the Bucks fans, uh, hence why they won this award. We've got two awards to get to before we wrap up here. The Nick Gelso Award for Best <laughs> Seal and S Personality. Again... <laughs> Amazing. Many, many write-in nominees, are literally hundreds of nominees, and thanks to everyone who voted in. But again, there can only be one winner. Drumroll, please. The winner of the 2024 CLNS Best Personality goes to 
Jack Simone and Sam LaFrance of the How About Them Celtics podcast. <laughs> this one was tight. Congratulations to these two as they make their way to the stage to accept their award. Michelle Obama, Michelle Obama? <laughs> very, very happy with the results uh, of this one. Uh, congrats to those two. Look, um, I was happy to see these guys win the award. Uh, obviously, huge fan of the How About Them Celtics podcast. I think a, a huge catalyst for us starting this show was <laughs> Jack chiming in here in the chat. Uh, was to to bring uh, something to the forefront of Celtics podcasting where um, not only were we analytical about the team, but the emotional aspect of fandom was well conveyed and sort of professionally conveyed via a high quality product. And I think we do a good job of that. Jack and Sam uh, do a similarly amazing job at that, but they're there in Boston with the team in the press room, making regular contact with personnel from the Celtics, which just takes this whole thing to a whole nother level. Um, so I was really glad to see those guys come out with this award. Uh, thoughts? And would you throw in any additional CLNS nominees uh, as runner-ups in this one, guys? R- real quick. Okay, so we had write-ins, right? Yeah. Jake got votes. Ben got votes. Yeah, Well-deserved. We I did not. That's why. <laughs> Except the problem is that my mom listens to this show. Oh, fuck, no. mom. You couldn't even vote for me. Come on. You can't give me one. I called her. I was like, mom, what the hell? She's like, I voted for Jake. And I'm like, all right. I get it. Oh, that's awesome. So no, Jack Shout and out Sam. Mooney. Jack and Sam rule. They're great. Their show is awesome. Their pregame show is amazing. That well deserved, well deserved. Shout out Xanus was up in the voting. I'm surprised. I feel like if you like our show, maybe you're not a Xanus guy, but you know, that's good to go. He's a popular yeah. guy. Yeah, that's right. Um, I loved it. Uh, Bobby Manning got votes. I mean, me personally, I would never. I'm like, I wish we could have split Sam and Jack apart because uh, me and Jack have been feuding over the Xavier Tillman three point <laughs> situation now. And yeah, I would. Such I would. A I, would Obama guy. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I would never. I would never vote for someone with such outrageous takes about Xavier Tillman's three point. <laughs> um, willingness but yeah. um but i will say someone else that like got a lot of like single votes that like would have added up to it a real percentage was noah um yeah. who's new on the beat this year who has been incredible yeah so she would have gotten a, a bigger slither than the graph is showing because a few people just typed it in differently mm-hmm. so she's been awesome and then obviously the funniest submission was jared zero so shout out Jared Zero. Um, shout out Jared Zero. I hope, yeah, I hope Twitter finds, legend. Yeah, the I hope, immortal. I hope, I hope he finds a new couch to podcast from soon. <laughs> Bobby Manning uh, walking away with a, a nice chunk yeah, of awards there as well. Sure. To a shout out to everyone who was uh, nominated. Pretty much everyone who works for CLNS or under the CLNS umbrella, except for Wayne Spooty, uh, got a, a nomination <laughs> in that one. So uh, uh, get get your minds right, people, uh, and vote for Spooty this time next year. Okay. <laughs> We've got one award remaining. At least my mom better. <laughs> yeah. That's right. This whole Spoony family really better get on that for next year. It's true. The final award, the best award, you might say, the Aaron Baines Corner 3 Award for Most Surprising Skill Set. Again, pages upon pages of write-in nominations for this one. The winner, however, is... O'Shea Brissett's offensive rebounding. I think an unsurprising runaway winner on this one got 36.8% of the overall vote. And I'm scrolling through pages and pages of nominations here. So for it to get (laughs) 37% of all of those votes uh, is quite outstanding Uh, and a very surprising skill set. I think you can safely say that Brissett came in, you know, first couple of possessions of his first minutes on the court and just started vacuuming up like a, a, a spaceship, space of getting access to a newly opened spaceship. Wow, I just completely butchered that analogy. <laughs> Vacuuming all the air out of the vessel uh, is a show shape for set. Uh, crashing the boards there, guys. Wow, I wish we weren't live so I could cut that out. <laughs> um, just, just an incredible uh, and surprising skill set there. Um, and not one that I expected with all of the great write-ups about Brissette uh, going into the beginning of the season. I just want to quickly point out how insane the Aaron Baines thing was so we know why he's named <laughs> yeah. uh, like this award's named after him so in that season 17 18 season he was 3 for 21 for the entire season and then in the playoffs he was 11 for 23 so like honestly one of the most astounding things that's ever happened uh, and then he goes on to be a legit three point shooter stretch big for the remainder of his career going back to um, going back to Australia as well so uh, shout out Aaron Baines. I, I didn't understand. I didn't. I didn't look. O'Shea won. Happy for him. Um, well, not for me. Uh, I thought my my vote. Um, Peyton Pritchard's offensive rebounding. 
far more far more surprising and far more impactful and important uh, for this team, in my opinion. And then also uh, Jalen Brown's defense, I thought, I think deserved a nod here as well. But I mean, Peyton Pritchard, I think third in offensive rebounding percentage of players 6'4 and under behind only Gary Payton and Alex Caruso, a stat that I will be citing till I die, I think. That's like just <laughs> ingrained into my brain. Um, so yeah, Peyton Pritchard's offensive rebounding for me, robbed, snubbed, ridiculous. Dude, Jalen's left hand being second, I think is a really great one because yeah. like he had some sick left-handed finishes this year. Um, but I just didn't know what to expect with Brissett because I feel like I, you know, I didn't watch a lot of indie when they sucked last year. Um, and I, the, my like memories of O'Shea Brissett are like the dude who sometimes can make threes and not get cooked on defense, but he's a fucking maniac. Like he's nuts, dude. Like he's like jumping over back, like very Neesmith vibes from O'Shea Brissett. So it did surprise me just like how incredibly hard he played. Um, so, you know, our offensive rebounding was like six, uh, percentage points better when O'Shea was on the court. It was like eight when Pritchard was on the court. So, you know, it kind of gives it, you know, that's kind of an argument for Pritchard being the most surprising, but, um, I think, I think it's a deserving winner. Shout out to O'Shea. Like he had to win something, you know, he was, he should have been in the Vibesman award too. Like, you know, he's a nice 600 minute season from O'Shea Brissett. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if you guys have any bonus awards that you want to like kick off the dome here, but best vlog, O'Shea Brissett, uh, <laughs> the number one blog on the team. Yeah, easy. Uh, a runaway award winner for that one. But yeah, just sticking with this uh, surprising skill set it was. So yeah, the, the runners up, you guys mentioned the second runner up, Jalen Brown's or first runner up, I should say, Jalen Brown's left hand. Second runner up is Sam Hauser's mid range pull up jumper, which got 17.4% of the votes. Carmelo. The next runner up <laughs> with 9%. Of the votes is Xavier Tillman's corner three point shot, the fourth most surprising skill set uh, on the team. It doesn't exist. Disgusting. <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> disgusting. The, pe- the people can, have spoken. I can only imagine how many people. I'm, I'm guessing Jack Simone just created uh, 40 <laughs> accounts and and voted for for Tillman as many times as possible. I know. I know. Yeah. RJ in the Discord definitely voted for for Tillman's three totally. point shot to fuck with me as well. Yeah, uh, <laughs> just disgusting, ridiculous. <laughs> But, um, bag. I, I I won award that I thought coming off off the dome, the Isaiah Thomas ex- exceeded expectations award, because I think that it in that sixteen seventeen season, I mean, no one expected him to be a top five MVP finisher. Um, I mean, uh, Joe Mazzulla maybe, Kristaps Porzingis maybe. I think the exceeded expectations bucket, uh, Derek White, I think falls into that basket as well. So uh, maybe an award for next year that uh, we just came up with. Absolutely. All right. Well, look, we're going to wrap it up there. Thanks, uh, everyone, for voting on these awards. (laughs) That was amazing. Uh, This was a lot of fun. Uh, Like I said, thanks to everyone who voted on these awards. We'll make sure that we publish the results uh, so that you can check out the runners up and all the work and effort that went into creating the show. Thanks for watching live or listening later on the podcast feed. We'll be back live Saturday night at 8 p.m. for a round one preview with Dan Greenberg, a.k.a. Stool Greeny and Barstool Sports. Spoonie, Jake. Love your work, guys. Until next time, go Celtics. I love them!